Good to be back with you, uh, Jeffrey. It's great to be back at Future Proof. Yeah, another nice day. Even uh, less hot than last time, but just as sunny. I, I have to admit, I didn't have Bill Gross attacking you on my bingo card this year. Who? <laughs> So we're just going to address the elephant in the room, and then we're going to get to the substance of this conversation, because it was Bill Gross at this event yesterday who took a shot at you, uh, your former competitor, obviously at PIMCO, took a shot at your moniker as the Bond King. He said, first of all, to be a Bond King or Queen, you need a kingdom. PIMCO had two trillion, okay? Double Line's got like 55 billion. Come on, that's no kingdom. That's like Latvia or Estonia. <laughs> now, he also, he said... He said you trashed him after he went to your house and tried to get you guys to work together and said, and look at his record for the last five, six, or seven years. I got you back, Jeff. So let's just address that, and then let's move on. But what, what is your response to that? I don't care. I just don't care. It doesn't bother you one bit? Uh, it's sad that somebody that's been out of the business for 10 years and is still trying to, I don't know, I guess, exercise the demons, I guess. It's sad, but I hope he's doing fine. Does the world really need two battling billionaire Bond Kings? I never wanted that title. I never embraced it. I really don't know what it means. Uh, we're doing great. Our five-year numbers are great. Uh, things are good, and we manage a lot more than 55 billion, so I don't know. Well, the last I checked... Four, you, you, four, four Pinocchios. The, the last I checked, at least at the end of 2021, it was three times that. Yeah, I don't I know don't, what don't it is know. today, but about 100 billion. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. It's a strange thing. I I actually uh, don't want to manage more money than I do. I, I stopped marketing my largest fund 12 years ago because I didn't want it to be more than a certain amount because I thought at a certain uh, critical mass you end up being an index fund at best. And uh, certainly the last chapter in Bill's career, it was a lot, lot worse than an index fund. So it is I, hope, interesting. I hope he retires and uh, feels better about himself. It, it, is, it is interesting, though, to, to, to hear you say that you don't care about necessarily AUM when that's sort of been the, the thing you put on your mantle as a fund manager is how much money you can have under management. Why isn't that important to you anymore? What's important to me is, is uh, happiness on a day-to-day -day basis. And whether I manage uh, 40 billion, 400 billion, it, it, it's exactly the same to me. Uh, this, this idea that your AUM uh, defines you, it, it's just weird. I mean, I, I've capped many of my strategies that I could have raised twice, three times as much money but I didn't think that it would be fun. I didn't think I'd be happier doing that. I actually thought it would be more difficult because you have, what goes along with that is more, more clients, uh, more hassles, and probably incrementally uh, less rewarding because you're less successful in terms of results. Well, the reason why you do have the moniker, the Bond King, is because you are looked at uh, as one of those voices that people want to hear from, not just on you know, where fixed income is going as, a, as an investment, but bigger picture, what your views yeah. are of, yeah. of the I mean, Fed and, and all of that, which you've become one of the most trusted and looked to voices yeah. on. I, I appreciate that because I think to the extent that I think that any label like Bond King or anything like that makes any sense, it's not because of your AUM. It's just like in, in the world of art. It's not how many pictures you painted. It's influence. What makes people important in any industry is influence. The fact that they were able to have an effect on the direction of their uh, profession or in helping people or the way people think about things. So I appreciate that comment, Scott, because that's exactly, that's exactly right. It's about influence. That's what makes people that have been competitors with mine, they, they seem to somehow don't like the fact that I have influence. And I guess it's because they wish that they did. And you can't get influence by waking up in the morning and saying I'm going to influence people. You get it by saying things that over the arc of time 
people find helpful, people find provocative, and people ultimately um, find that actually you have an insight. I remember when I was on the cover of Barron's, they had, that's how, how this all started, this damn Bond King thing, they said the, the new Bond King. And the guy that interviewed me, he said, it's so strange, I've been following you for so many years, and you say all these nutty things, and a lot of them come true. And so I think that's what it's about. I, I, I've monitored my hit rate, if you want to call it that, of ideas, of performance, of trades, of performance versus benchmarks and competitors, and I've got a 40-year record, so it's almost <laughs> statistically significant at this point um, that the hit rate's about 70, a little over 70%, and that's true on most of my ideas, too. I'm right about 70% of the time, which is a very, very high hit rate. I mean, in, in the investment business, if you have a 55% hit rate, you, you have a career. But a 70% hit rate, as good as it is, it means that you've been wrong 30% of the time. And if you've been at it for 40 years, that means I've been wrong for 12 years. Thank God they weren't 12 in a row. Because if you're wrong, if you're wrong for three in a row, you might be able to make it. Uh, five in a row, you end up uh, closing down your unconstrained bond fund at Janus. And, <laughs> and, and if, it's, if it's seven in a row, you're just, you're just you know, relegated to obscurity. So that's what I think about, uh, I don't, People, people ask me, like, who do you think, like, potential clients would ask me over the years, who do you think your competitors, you know, that are good? And I say, I have no idea. I don't think about them. And they say, wow, they, they're sure fixated on you. And I, I say, I, I can't help that. I, they, they can do what they want. I don't know what other people are doing. I don't care what they're doing. And I guess that's what bothers them. Maybe they're fixed on it, fixated on you in some respects because, you're, you know, your opinions are closely followed. Um, you're not afraid to share your opinions. Um, you know, being critical of the Fed, certainly at times, you, you've done interviews with me on multiple occasions where you called Jay Powell Mr. Magoo. Yep. Um, that was, that was uh, right at the beginning of the tightening cycle. Yeah, I said that he should have raised rates 200 basis points when he raised them. I don't know if it was the first time at 25 or the second time at 50. It was one of those two. And I think we can all agree now, talk about saying nutty things that end up being right. I think I was right. Because if they had raised rates 200 basis points, first up, we wouldn't have had the inflation rate go to 9.1% on the headline CPI and 18% on export prices and 15% year over year on import prices. It wouldn't have happened. But unfortunately, there's a Mr. Magoo characteristic. And what I mean by Mr. Magoo is there's a lot of you are too young to know who Mr. Magoo is, but there was a cartoon, this guy, he was uh, voiced by Jim Backus, the guy from Gilligan's Island that was, well, who, well Thurston Howell III. And he, you probably don't know Gilligan's Island either, <laughs> if, you, if, you don't, if you don't know Mr. Magoo. You're dating yourself now. I, I'll date, I'm 64 this year. So uh, Mr. Magoo, one of, the, one of the shticks that they had in the cartoons was he would drive this jalopy and he couldn't see. That was the whole thing about Mr. Magoo. He needed glasses, but he didn't wear any, so he couldn't see very well. And he would just drive his jalopy until he hit a tree. And I said, that's what the Fed's doing. They're just going to grope their way through raising interest rates. They're going to do it systematically and sequentially, and they're going to keep doing it until they hit a tree. Uh, if they had raised the 200, that would have been Paul Volcker-ish. Paul Volcker actually did raise interest rates 200 basis points in one fell swoop, and it wasn't at a meeting either. It was on a Saturday night, of all things, called the Saturday Night Massacre. He raised rates 200 basis points because he realized he needed to get inflation under control. That's what the Fed should have done. And uh, so now they're bumping along. They're, they're still, they're, they're a little bit back into Mr. Magoo mode. I thought they were doing okay there for a while, but now they're raising interest rates almost on stubbornness, I, I would say. I, I don't really see any reason for them, and I think that's become something of a consensus. They did raise them at the last meeting. Um, I thought that was Magoo-like. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens next. I, it just seems to me that there are it, a lot, a lot of things that suggest we're late cycle in this economy. But, but don't you think that they, despite the criticism from you early on and others, even now, don't you think that they deserve, and, and j Powell deserves credit for doing what they did Albeit late, yeah, yeah, fine. I mean, as a but as look a, where the economy yeah. is today. We, he really didn't drive into 
the economy, uh, huge wall. The now, maybe they will, but... The economy isn't any good. The economy is only growing because of, we have a budget deficit that is 8% of GDP. If we didn't have a budget deficit that was 8% of GDP, growth would be 8% less. So we have a budget deficit in a so-called good economy that is similar to the, the uh, level that the budget deficit peaked at in the global financial crisis. It's about the same today in, as the same as the depths of the global financial crisis. And what people don't, don't understand, I think, I, I think, and I hope, I'll give hope that Jay Powell understands this, that there is a massive increase that's coming at us in real time in the interest expense of the U.S. federal deficit. It's already gone up by about $400 billion, and a lot of maturities of the, of the Treasury's debt come due in the next few years. Those, those bonds that are coming due in the next few years were issued when interest rates were at zero, when the Fed funds rate was at zero for all these years, when the two-year Treasury was at 10 basis point for years and years. These are coming due, the five-year Treasury down at one half of a percent or less. These are coming due. And the interest rate, just using today's levels, who knows if they're gonna raise further, but just using today's levels, the rates are gonna go up by 500 basis points. And this is on trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. The CBO projects that by 2032, interest expense will equal 20% of our, of, our entire, uh, of, an, of our entire tax receipts will go to interest expense. And they predict no recession between now. That's, that's just the way they operate. And I can't blame them. How are they gonna factor in recessions? You know, you're gonna pretend one's gonna come three years from now or something. But you're, but you're still looking for one? Absolutely. I, I, I look for one next year. Um, and I, I think the indicators are getting really convincing in that regard. And, and uh, so this debt coming due would be just devastating. The Fed can't have interest rates at 5 6% and hold them there for the next few years without bankrupting everything about this country. And I think they realize that. And I, that, that's, I think they want the economy is slow quickly, and I think they want rates to go back down, because if this happens on their watch, uh, it's going to go down, you know, as, a, as a, an infamy, really. So, yeah, I, I, I think that the economy is definitely weakening. Um, I'm starting to notice articles in real time, just in the last couple of weeks, all kinds of firms saying job cuts, cutting 5%. Uh, I saw Goldman Sachs announcing job cuts. I see a lot of firms saying doing job cuts, and I expected that this was gonna happen. It, in the world of predictions and in the world of finance and investments, there's one thing I've learned. You can sort of divine a little bit what the future might look like, but the timing of it is really, really hard. And as a general rule, everything takes longer to happen than you think it will. It, everything takes forever. For, people are impatient uh, relative to f financial trends, and you know what the trend's gonna be, but you don't know when it's gonna happen. So I, I think when we did the lockdown and the work from home stuff for a couple of years, I came to the theory that people, managers, business owners would learn that there's a certain fraction of their employee base that is really just mailing it in. And you saw that particularly in work from home where I, I observed, it was kind of a fun exercise. You do, a, you do a, a Teams meeting or Zoom or something and you'd have 60 people on it and the meeting would end and it was kind of a fun exercise to not disengage from the meeting and see how many people are still there 15 minutes later. The meeting's over, it was an hour and 10 minute meeting, but they're still there 15 minutes later. Who can tell me what that means? Who can tell me what that means? It means that person wasn't really at the meeting or certainly wasn't at the whole meeting, right? So you start to realize that, you start to realize, what are these people doing? Because you get, it's a different prism through which to judge work performance and work habits, and people get revealed. And I feel like there's something about the moment right now uh, where once there becomes a trend of layoffs, so Goldman Sachs is doing it, a lot of companies are announcing they're doing it, you start to realize that maybe it's a trend. So let's say that 5% we have 5% uh, layoffs, which doesn't sound like all that much. I mean, GE used to have a policy under Jack Welch, I think it was, where they would lay off 10% of their workforce every single year as a way of upgrading. It's a way of making the tough decisions. 
And I, I thought, I always thought that was a little bit, you know, Machiavellian and tough, but I, I understand it. But I think once you look, look to your left and look to your right and you see firm A laying off 5%, firm B laying off 15%, suddenly you get the impression that the unemployment rate's about to go up because it becomes a trend. And so the unemployment rate that's announced the first Friday of every month has just done the first convincing recession signal that it's given in years, and that is it's crossed over its one-year moving average. It's at 3.8, and uh, it spiked up by 30 basis points the last report, and that was kind of a shock to people. And that's, that's, that's a sign, once it goes over its 36-month moving average, which it's going to do by our calculation by the end of this year, a recession's pretty much a lock. So let me ask you this. Do, do you think that the Fed is done raising rates? Let's deal with that I first do. and then I, I want to yeah. follow. I do. I think because you thought they were, after they raised in May, you told me you thought they were done, and then they raised again, and you said that they should be done. They shouldn't have raised then, yeah. but now you think they're done. I, I think so. Yeah, I think they're done. I, I, th I think that uh, we have enough economic weakness. I think what's the one re thing that they need to change, to be done, is they need the core PCE to drop below four. It's been at four to four and a half for about two, two and a half years. And that's the one inflation indicator that is just sideways. All the rest of them are clearly very substantially have come off their highs, not the core PCE. And that's because of services. Uh, and, uh, and to a certain extent, uh, wages are part of that services component. That has to come down. I think once that goes below four, and I think it's at 4.1 today, I think that will definitively make them stop. So what do you make of the, there's a journal story yesterday. You know, it, it seemed to be before that the Fed was willing to err on the side of doing too much rather than too little. And Jay Powell was pretty explicit yes. about that yep. for most of the meetings over the last year. Now right. there seems to be a shift that they don't want to cause an unnecessary downturn by doing too much because they've been able to get to where they are now without really destroying the economy. How, what do you make of that article and, and that idea I, of a I, shift? I was traveling yesterday, I didn't see the article. But the whole idea of this shift where it's no longer about erring on the side of doing too much, it's erring on the side of not causing unnecessary harm. I, that's a little bit of a surprise to me. I don't, I don't feel like I've heard that type of rhetoric. I, I thought he was rather hawkish at Jackson Hole. I, I didn't. I, I didn't I, I kind of felt like he's been resolute in a very consistent way. I, I'll have to take a closer look at that, that commentary. It would be disappointing if he did change to me because the one thing I can commend him for has been his consistency and resolution really for the last two years. I, I, I think it's a, a bad sign if he gets away from that. But you just said you, you don't think they should hike anymore and you don't think they will. Yeah, uh, that's true. But I, I just think it's important for Jay to be as consistent as possible and to, and to not go back and forth. So I, again, I didn't see that article, but depending on how harsh the tone is of a shift, I'll, I, I would be more critical, it was a very harsh tone. I, I think my, my basic theme is I, I, think that, I think that there's going to be a recessionary movement and I'm surprised that people don't think that there's, th that so few people think that we could have a deflationary spell in 2024, because I think, I think we could. What I mean by deflation is that you would have, well, we have deflation in, in the PPI right now it, on a year-over-year -year basis. One has to be, one has to be very, very careful about all these statistics because everything is so skewed by the pandemic, by the government's policies. So the, the economists that have been the most wrong uh, this year, I'd say, were, are the, mo the, the more you lean towards being a monetarist, the more wrong you've been. Because at the beginning of this year, the M2 money supply was negative year over year. And that's a very, very uh, telling, historically, sign that you're about to experience economic contraction. But what that misses, it, and it's, it's tied into the PPI, like I said, the PPI is deflationary. Yes, it, definitionally it is. Year over year, it's negative 2%. Okay, so that's how that's deflation, right? Prices are down on the PPI. But if you actually just look at the price level, you know, it goes up like this over time, then the government prints a lot of money, it goes like this, and now it's up there and it's down to here. That's not really deflationary, you know what I mean? It's year over year it is. But you want you, you need the PPI to be like negative ten 
to be talking about deflation off of that type of level. It's the same thing is true of M2 money supply. Yes, it's down year over year, but it was up so much. It's the same chart as the PPI. It's going like this. They, they, they print, you know, $4 trillion, and now it's down a little bit. Well, that, that viewpoint is skewed by the unusual circumstances of this, this, this set. And I, I think that's true of a lot of the things that those of us that have been around for 40 years think we know about. This is one of my most important ideas, and one that I'm, I've been pro processing now for almost two years, and that is what's different about the coming cycle versus what we think we know. I, I use that quote from Mark Twain. It's not what you, know, what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you think you know that just ain't so. That's what gets you in trouble. You think you know something. Well, what do we think we know? We think we know how interest rates move. We think we know how money supply affects the economy. We think we know about Fed policy. But wait a minute. Haven't we been in a 40-year interest rate decline from you know, early 80s until the early 2020s? Isn't it just a declining interest rate environment? Sure, there's backups and so forth. But the secular trend was obviously declining interest rates. Well, maybe what we think we know about default rates, about corporate management of debt, maybe it's all informed by an, an anachronistic prototype. Maybe rising interest rates are different than falling interest rates, and I, I know they are. So, for example, thank God that uh, corporate America extended out their maturities at very low rate levels and very tight spreads, so they're in really good shape. But what happens when that debt has to be rolled over and the interest rate isn't four, but it's nine? which is where it is right now for small businesses. The, the borrowing rate for small businesses was four three years ago. It's now nine. And if the Fed hikes, it's gonna go higher. Who can handle a floating rate debt that's resetting every three months that goes from four to nine? Some can, that's good, but we know some can't. And, when, and that number is gonna be higher in a rising rate environment than it is in a falling rate environment. And the recovery rate is gonna be much lower. So the, the risks are much higher out there. And I, I think that's, that's really important for everything. The stock market bottomed in 1982, right? And it topped, it looks like, in early 2020, 20, 2022. Maybe it has something to do with the interest rates going from 14 to zero. And maybe with interest rates rising, it creates much more competition. Right now, the competition that bonds give stocks is one of the highest in any of our lifetimes in terms of the risk premium on bonds versus the risk premium on stocks, in terms of the, the yield on bonds versus the yield on stocks. And uh, that, I think, is going to be an issue for 2024. Well, last year, you said, basically right after this conference, that you saw the bond market being the most attractive in 10 years. Yeah. If you really want to go for it, and you should, my advice is to sell stocks and buy opportunistic bonds. Yeah. But what about now? I'd say it's about the same now. I, I think the environment today is remarkably similar to where it was a year ago. The, the, things haven't really changed all that much from a year ago. Interest rates even haven't changed that much. The 10-year treasury was at, was at four and change when we met a year ago. It's at 4.3 4 today. You know, what's changed is the two-year treasury yield has, been, has, has, has gone up a lot. But stocks have certainly rallied a lot. At, at, least, at least seven of them have rallied a lot. Uh, and uh, certainly Japanese stocks have done pretty well. And uh, European stocks have, not, have underperformed a little bit this year, but they've hung in there now for the past three years. So I think, I think bonds are less attractive today than they were a year ago because the things that I was referencing a year ago were things like, you know, triple, tri double B corporate bonds, double B, yes, back securities and stuff. And junk bonds are up like 10% year to date. Uh, uh, at least uh, bank loans are, which are the top performing fixed income asset class. So I, I, think, I think we have a feeling in the stock market that feels like an echo of late 2021, where it's being led by uh, you know, uh, mar market-weighted indices as opposed to equal-weighted indices. Not so much recently, but as a broad theme that's characterized 2023. And uh, what's different, though, is the... Uh, lower tiers of the, of the corporate bond market have done quite well uh, over this time period. They've done very well s s over the past year. So I think they've, they've done well. Stocks, stocks are a mixed bag. It sort of depends what, what you're looking at. Obviously, the NASDAQ, after a terrible year, has done 
wonderfully this year. Well, what if I would say, well, a lot's changed since we sat on this stage a year ago. Most importantly, the Fed is closer to the end than the beginning yeah. where they were a year ago. And that, yeah. in many respects, is why the stock market is at 4,500 on the S&P today. Yeah, I, I think that's right. It, we're in this sort of strange moment where you get the benefits of the stock market being a discounting mechanism, and you don't see the demons on the horizon. So you, you, have the, you have these windows in time where you're late in the tightening cycle, you get the stock market does well. Uh, it's kind of like the bank loan market, which I, I think is the most fascinating part of, of, the, uh, of the fixed income market because it's been the place to be for the past couple of years, and I think it's still the place to be. But you have to watch it like a hawk now. You had it on autopilot a couple of years ago. Because we're getting to the point where the, it, the, the thing that makes it so attractive to the bondholder is that the interest rate is 9, 10, 11%. The problem, though, is that the lender, the borrower, has to pay 9, 10, or 11%. And that's fine as long as their business conditions are stable or good. But once you get cracks in the system, you have the double whammy. And that is you have the uh, defaults start to go up and you have perhaps the coupons start to go down because the Fed will have to slash interest rates. One thing that I think we do know from history, and I don't, don't think this is different this time, is that I think that the Fed raises rates by taking the stairs and they cut rates by taking the elevator. When will they first cut rates, you think? I think it's going to be in the first half of next year. I think it's going to be when the economy really weakens. One of the things I've been thinking about relative to the economy is one of the reasons the economy has been better than people expected this year is uh, the deficit's huge. I talked about that earlier. But why is the deficit huge? Well, first of all, the, the politicians are irresponsible. That's one of the reasons why it's huge. But the other reason is that many taxes haven't been paid for 2022. That's just started recently. Uh, New York, I didn't think, had to, had to pay 2022 taxes until I think it was uh, a couple of months ago. California, we still haven't paid our 2022 taxes for state or federal. And so that the budget deficit, because of the deferment of tax payments, is up by about $400 billion. And that's not insignificant, even though we have a, an economy. I mean, that, that's, that's close to a percentage point of economic growth. But what happens now? when people suddenly have to pay their taxes. And not only have to pay them in, in here in California, October 15th, they got to pay them again in six months. So we're used to having a tax cycle where you had one year of earnings and you paid one year of taxes. Now we have a six month window, at least in California and a couple other states that are much smaller, where you're going to have six months of earnings and you're going to pay two years of taxes. So sure, some people are responsible like me and I've got it sitting in a in a bank account waiting to be paid. But a lot of people have changed their lifestyle. And this is another reason that, that I think people are missing on the growing strains in the economy is has to do with student loan debt forgiveness uh, and non-payment on rents and things like that. People adjust their lifestyles, particularly if, if circumstances are changed and they endure for a, a, a sufficient length of time. So what, people didn't have to pay their student loan debt. What did they do? They went on a, a trip to Antarctica on their credit card because not, they, they could, they're used to paying interest on debt, but they'd have to pay their, credit, their student loan debt, so they'll find some other debt that has the same type of bill. Well, now that the, the, the spigot's been turned back on for student loan debt, they have two forms of debt now. And we're, we, we saw that in the most recent data report, which is really a shocker. And this is one of the most recessionary reports that have come out in, in recent weeks, and that is revolving credit by the consumer, which had been non-existent back in 2020 because the government paid everything for everybody, and then started to get really strong about a year ago, and we had kind of record types of month-on-month -month debt, debt growth in revolving credit card debt. Well, last month, the thing that ha has happened right at the front edge of every single recession happened. The last three recessions, leading into them, you have tremendous credit card debt. That's what's sort of fueling the euphoric mood. And then all of a sudden, something happens. And you have a month where actually the credit card debt does not expand at all. And you go from credit card debt going up like this, and it's up like this at a really high level, and then out of nowhere, it goes negative. And that just happened in the last report. That's what happened right before the last two recessions. It means people aren't feeling it anymore and are, and are tapped out.
Let's get through a few topics that I want to get to in the, in the time, the nine minutes or so that, that we have left. You've been recommending long duration bonds, right? You've increased duration in your flagship fund to the highest level ever. Yeah. That's correct? Th that's right. And where does that go from here? Well, t when I say it's the highest uh, interest rate risk or duration we've ever have, I want to make sure that I, I uh, add to that, it's still slightly less than a bond market index fund. So we've always been at a lower interest rate rate. But the, um, so the duration is about six, and the duration of a bond index is about six, six and a third. And uh, we've, we got to that level, basically, at interest rates where they are today. Right at about four, four and a quarter on the 10-year. I think we're a little higher than that today. I haven't checked uh, this morning. But uh, yeah, and, and basically, a lot of people are buying T-bills. There's a very popular uh, kind of cutesy saying, T-bill and chill, as, an, as investment advice, because the six-month bill is 550. Uh, I don't recommend the six-month bill at 550 because you might be rolling it over at three, uh, six months from now. I'm not predicting that, but it could happen. Uh, I think you're better off in just low-duration uh, bond funds, and depending upon your risk tolerance, you can buy higher quality stuff. You don't, if it's CMBS makes you break out in hives because of the commercial real estate market, you can buy something else that yields six and a half and has a two or three year type of a life. And there's no risk in these things. They're, you know, you, 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 you wake up, it's going to be two or three years from now, and you're, you're earning that kind of yield. And if you really want to go uh, into a risky position, you can just buy double B bank loans or single B bank loans and get nine, ten percent. And once the Fed starts cutting rates, you probably want to get out of that. But there's, there's yield all over the place. And last year, it was more out the curve a little bit. Uh, if you'd gone down in credit, you wanted to buy like 10-year bonds because the yields, the yields were 12% when we were sitting here a year ago, and they're 10% they're today. So they've rallied 200 basis points, and you yield, or, I mean, you've had huge returns on some of this stuff, but it's still attractive. It's just not as attractive as it was a year ago. What about mortgages, which you've liked as mortgages, well, agency well, mortgages? I mean, yeah, the, yeah. the uh, mortgage uh, market's been obviously stable. Yeah. Well, the problem with the mortgage market uh, has been that the Fed is not buying, and uh, banks are not buying, and so it's really up to real money, which means it's in very strong hands, but the, uh, the m number of buyers has been a little bit weak. So. Uh, mortgages have performed about the same as treasuries year to date, uh, and the, re the reason has been uh, that th th there's been lack of buying. Now, what's fascinating about the agency mortgage market is for most of the last 40 years, it's been at risk of refinancing because rates were falling and falling and falling, and ultimately they got down below 3%. And so an awful lot of people have mortgages that are at 3% or even a little bit lower. But the, the new issue mortgage rate is at seven and a half. So what that means is that if you had a mortgage at 3%, if you were to sell that mortgage to somebody, you could sell it, to, they would take over your mortgage for you, they would buy it from you for like 130 because the price is so depressed because the, you know how bonds work, when yields go up, the prices drop. So the mortgage-backed market for most of the last 40 years has been at risk of refinance. It was always at a premium. When you have bonds that are callable, that are at a premium, they can't go up much in price because if bond yields fall, they'll be refinanced into a new loan, so they get rolled over. Well, the mortgage market today, broadly speaking, the agency-guaranteed mortgage market is at a price of about 85. So there's zero risk of refinancing. In fact, if everybody refinanced today, great we go from 85 to 100. So for the first time in my career, which is 40 years, the mortgage market is actually has no of that, none of that negative aspect. So you have, it's just pure extra yield. And on top of that, you know, you, you, you have this discounted dollar price and there's no supply in mortgages at all. So going forward, no supply because who is moving? Who that has a 3% mortgage is gonna move quickly? and take out a mortgage of seven and a half. I mean, it's just a, a devastating thing. The, the average monthly payment on the median, the median, the, the monthly payment on a median priced home in America has gone up by more than 100% in the past three years. And so the monthly payment has gone to such a level that now the median priced home in America to, to afford it using the typical formula of whatever it is, 30% of your uh, take-home pay. There's different metrics that people use, but using a very standard one, the income you need to service that mortgage under that formula is now $190,000 a year. 
at today's mortgage rates. So all of this is obviously gonna, gonna hurt the economy. That's what rising rates do. But like I said at the outset, it always takes forever. It takes longer than people think. But uh, I think uh, uh, forever is gonna be 2024. And lastly, uh, another topic that we've spoken about on numerous occasions, the dollar. Yep. Um, which has been obviously strengthening uh, again. It's, a, it's in a range. I mean, it went, it went up to about 115 for a minute on the Dixie, and then it dropped all the way to slightly below 100. Your pro, pre prior trade, I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, just so people remember, you, you had predicted that it was going to fall after this yep. period of strength, and it was yep. strong for a while, and then it ultimately did yep. begin to fall. And now here we are sort of reversing again. So is, yeah. it, is it just a moment in time? Do you it's, expect it's, it's, it as the economy weakens, it's the, the dollar it's, to weaken? It's, it's the Fed. The, the, when the recession comes, the dollar is going to weaken. And you'll, you'll notice that the dollar was weakening when, pe when, the, when the predictions of recession back in, say, March of this year were, were, were commonplace. That was really falling. But now those have gone away. Stock market's up, dollar up. These all, these all go together. When, when the recession comes, you're going to see the dollar really perform badly because the budget deficit is going to go to 20% of the GDP, and it's going to be really ugly. I, I will say one thing, and I said that um, in the coming period, U.S. bank stocks would underperform uh, European and Japanese bank stocks, and that has certainly been the case. Uh, U.S. bank stocks have done nothing uh, in, in the past couple of years, and Japanese bank stocks are up s about 50%. About and European bank stocks are up about 15%. In the next recession, I think that gap is going to get much more severe, and U.S. bank stocks are going to be really, really challenged. Well, one of the reasons why the dollar has been stronger lately is because there's so much concern about what's happening around the world. China's weaker than expected. Europe looks pretty weak right. as well. You have, at times, liked emerging markets. You liked, I think, yeah. India maybe India more than, the, than in, others, but what India about for, now relative to what you're seeing o overseas? I, I really need to see the emerging market currency index to show some signs of life versus the dollar to like emerging markets. I, I, I think, here, here's, here's the big picture. Um, I think the dollar weakens tremendously in the next recession. I think it's because the response to the next recession is going to be a complete disaster relative to our fiscal position. And that's going to be the wake-up call, where we realize that the United States is bankrupt, that we cannot uh, honor our liabilities. The United States has nearly $200 trillion of unfunded liabilities. That's almost eight times GDP. For us to pay that in today's purchasing power, we would have to pay 10% of our GDP for 80 years. We'd have to have four generations of depression. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do, therefore, is go to a complete uh, abandonment of, of uh, you know, the dollar, and we're going to see a restructuring of the U.S. financial system. And uh, if, you, if you think that I'm nutty, I've been talking about the restructuring of, of uh, entities, institutions around the world, but particularly the United States, really for the past 15 years. And I, I, if you don't see that coming now, you're just an ostrich with your head in the sand because of the way these things are going. It's shocking that we have a two-party system, and one of the parties won't let one of its most potentially promising candidates to even run in the primaries, RFK Jr. They're trying to keep him out of the primaries. It's just unbelievable. And they do that underneath the, the rhetoric of something about protecting democracy. Not letting a guy run is now our definition of democracy. Is that who you, you're supporting? No, I don't support anybody. But I, 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 uh, I, I wouldn't. Why don't I believe you? I, RFK, RFK is interesting. They don't like him because he actually doesn't toe the line. And you might have figured out by now that I'm not exactly a toe the line kind of guy. So I like that spirit in him. I don't really know much about his policy. I do think, when I first heard him speak, I thought his voice was going to be a real problem because he's hard to listen to. But I actually think it's, it'll, it will ultimately turn into a, to a positive because here he is, a, you know, from one of the most privileged families in the last several generations, and yet he's relatable in that way. I think it's a positive for him. I, I, I really think that uh, he should at least be given a chance. So, but that's, that's, what we've, that's what we've come to, and we come to the point where almost everybody realizes that the system isn't what they thought it was when they were 15 years old. I think that's a good note to leave it on. Uh, the Bond King, <laughs> Jeffrey Gunlock, thank you. Thank you very much.